All right, <clears throat> in this video, I'm going to go through the AQA A level chemistry paper from 2020. Uh, this is paper three. Uh, and I'll just do the first half of this paper in this video and finish it off in the next one. Okay, so question about oxides of nitrogen uh, from petrol and diesel engines. Explain how oxides of nitrogen are formed in engines. Well, uh, N2 from the air and O2 from the air react together under the conditions of very high temperature, which you get inside uh, a petrol or a diesel engine um, that you wouldn't get really elsewhere. Okay. Why is it desirable to decrease emissions of oxides of nitrogen from vehicles? Uh, it's because they cause acid rain and they also cause breathing difficulties. Okay. Right, <clears throat> then this question is about um, this stuff add blue, which is added to diesel engines. And it basically explains here, it contains ammonia uh, <clears throat> and the ammonia will react with NO2 in the exhaust. Um, the NO2 of course is harmful and it will, <clears throat> the NO2 will be reduced to nitrogen gas, okay? We have to balance this equation and we have to um, state the oxidation numbers of the uh, nitrogen uh, compounds. So if we remember the sum of the oxidation numbers is equal to the charge on the species. So let's do NO2, the charge on the, on the NO2 is zero. N, we don't know the oxidation number. We've got two oxygens, each one. Oxygen is a fixed oxidation number of minus two, so that makes minus four. So we'll just do a bit of algebra there. N plus four is the oxidation number of NO2. For ammonia, um, the oxidation number of ammonia, right? So nitrogen is unknown. Hydrogen is always plus one. And there's three of them in ammonia, so that's plus three is equal to zero. So N is equal to minus three. Minus three oxidation number in ammonia. And of course, uncombined element nitrogen, it's gonna be zero. Okay. Now, we've got to balance this equation. Now you can just do it by trial and error, or you can do it by using oxidation numbers. I think I'll use the oxidation numbers. So let's have a look at the, um, so this is plus four. This is minus three oxygen. Nitrogen is zero. Now we look at one of the nitrogens from the NO2, right? That is going to zero. So it's gone from plus four to zero, so it's been reduced. So it gains four electrons. As the oxidation number goes down by four. Whereas the nitrogen and the ammonia, that is going from minus three to zero. So that is actually losing three electrons. Now the amount of electrons gained has got to be equal to the amount of electrons lost. So how are we going to do that? We're going to multiply this one by three to give us 12 electrons and multiply this one by four to give us 12 electrons. So it's a balance. I'm going to put a three there. Um, and we're going to put a four in front of the ammonia. Right. We've got a total of seven nitrogen atoms. So that's going to be three and a half N2. Uh, and now we just need to check uh, if we've got the right number of hydrogens. Well, we've got in here, we've got four times three, that's 12 hydrogens. And um, so that means we are going to have to form six water molecules there. Let's just check we've got the right number of oxygens. Well, we've got three times uh, two, that's six oxygens, and we've got six oxygens in the H2O. So that is our balanced equation. Okay, uh, petrol vehicles have catalytic converters and they are heterogeneous catalysts. Uh, what is meant by the term heterogeneous catalyst? Well, first of all, a catalyst is something which uh, speeds up reaction. 
speeds up the rate, doesn't get used. And a heterogeneous means that the catalyst is in a different phase to the reactants and products. And that is usually, the catalyst is usually solid. And the reactants and products are usually gases. That is usually the case with a heterogeneous catalyst. So I'll probably write all of that down. Okay, one five. Some carbon particulates are also formed in both diesel and petrol engines. Uh, why are the particulates formed? Um, right. <coughs> the reason why is you get incomplete combustion. Okay, so instead of the Simply, that's all you need to say. So instead of the carbons in the hydrocarbon, whatever, getting oxidized to CO2, uh, they're not oxidized. They just, uh, well, they are oxidized because they lose the hydrogens, but it just forms carbon solid. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> here's a question about the group three, sorry, period three oxides. Sodium oxide forms a solution with a higher pH than magnesium oxide. So here's sodium oxide, and it forms about pH 14. Magnesium oxide, about pH 9, probably. Okay. Uh, when equal amounts of them in moles are added separately to equal, vol equal volumes of water, state why, why both oxides form alkaline solutions. Well, they both form alkaline solutions because there's some tendency of the oxide ions present in them, the O2 minus, to react with water. So the oxide ion acts as a base and removes a, a hydrogen from the water. So you get 2OH minus. So that's why they're going to form an alkaline solution. And then secondly, why is sodium oxide forms a higher pH? Right, so you get a much higher, so you get a higher concentration of OH minus because sodium oxide is uh, very soluble in water, whereas magnesium oxide is very sparingly soluble. Hardly any of it actually dissolves, a tiny bit does enough to make the pH, pH 9. Okay, now a reaction between phosphorus 5 oxide and water, well phosphorus 5 oxide is P4O10, so this is just straightforward recall question really, and you react that with water, you get phosphoric acid, which is H3PO4. So to balance that, we need to have four phosphoruses on the left, we've got four there. So that means we've got 16, or let's say we've got four times three, we've got 12 hydrogens on the right. So that means we need to have six waters. If you check the oxygens there, <clears throat> you've got uh, 10 plus six there makes 16, four times four, 16, so that's all balanced. Right, okay, in the contact process, sulfur, sulfur four oxide, which is of course SO2, is oxidized to SO3, sulfur six oxide, using a vanadium five catalyst. Okay, show how the, um, show two equations to show how the vanadium five oxide acts as a catalyst. Well, this again is straightforward recall, it is on the, um, these equations are in the specification saying you need to know them. So first of all, we're going to get SO2 is going to react with vanadium 5 oxide, which is that formula. Uh, the vanadium 5 oxide is going to be reduced. I will oxidize that to SO3, and it will go to vanadium 4 oxide there. And in the second reaction, the catalyst is regenerated. The vanadium 4 oxide reacts with oxygen uh, to form uh, vanadium 5 oxide again.
Okay, let's call this question. Right, explain why complexes <coughs> formed from transition metal ions are colored. Now there's only three marks going for this. So I'm gonna, occasionally you'll see this question as like a five mark or definitely a four mark question. So I'm just gonna give the full answer and then, um, and then say which bits were, or where the three marks were in the mark scheme in this case, but I'm gonna give the full answer, right. I'm going to say um, ligands bind to a transition metal iron, and that causes the three d orbitals to lose degeneracy. That means we normally say they, we say they're, they're the degenerate. They've all got the same energy. Each three, there's five of them. And they've all got the same degenerate, they're all the same energy, that's degenerate. Right, when the ligands bind, right, they have different energies, okay? Okay, <clears throat> and then what can happen is um, light in the visible spectrum, visible part of the spectrum uh, of certain frequencies absorbed, and what that will do, it will cause transitions of electrons from uh, one d orbital to a higher d orbital. Uh, to one of higher energy. So the energy of the, the light, yeah is used to promote the electrons, okay? And then I say here, not all frequencies are absorbed. So when white light is shone on the white light, and that's all frequencies, uh, only some are absorbed. Uh, some pass through. And this uh, gives the complex its color. Okay, for example, in the case of uh, blue, cop blue, green copper sulfate, uh, it's only the bluey green frequencies which get through the reds and the oranges and the violets all get absorbed. And so that's why it looks bluey green it's absorbing all the other colors now i think if you look in the marks in those three marks i think one goes for that one goes for that um and one goes for that i think that's what your three marks there you didn't actually have to mention the d orbitals in that case but normally you would do as i say that's i've got five marking points there so i would probably always answer like that Okay, uh, this is about colorimetry now then. Okay, so um, iron uh, can be, um, the amount of iron in uh, a, an iron tablet can be determined by colorimetry. So what they do is uh, dissolve the tablet in sulfuric acid. That will, of course, convert all the, uh, the iron, any iron metal to Fe2 plus or any iron compounds. And then you're going to oxidize it all to Fe3 plus there. Um, and react it with something so that uh, it absorbs what light of this wavelength, 490 nanometers. Make up the total solution to 250. Uh, and just take some of that out and measure the absorbance of 490 nanometers with a colorimeter. And then use a calibration graph. So I'm going to ask questions about that afterwards. We'll talk about that in a minute to find the concentration of the iron complex. Right. So first of all, let's see um, how we're going to uh, work out the energy gained by each excited electron. Okay. So right now, the energy absorbed by a, by the electron is given by this uh, equation. The energy is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by the frequency of the photon of light. Okay. 
And also we know the frequency of light. Uh, well, we've got this, the speed of light is equal to the frequency of light multiplied by the wavelength. We use the symbol lambda there. Okay. So first of all, we're gonna find out the, it gives us the uh, wavelength. So I'm gonna work out what frequency of that is. So let's find out F. So we're gonna rearrange this equation. First of all, so F is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength of light. Okay. The speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. Right, and we, this is in nanometers. We need to convert this in, into meters. So it's going to be 490 nanometer, 10 to the minus nine, okay, times 10 to the minus nine. So divided by 490 times 10 to the minus nine. And that gives us a frequency of 6.122 times 10 to the 14 per second seconds to the minus one, or sometimes you can use hertz, so that's the same thing as per second. Uh, now we've got to put that into this equation, E is equal to HF, so don't need to rearrange anything, E, that'll be the energy in joules, Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Okay, multiply by the frequency in per seconds, that's 6.122 times 10 to the 14. Uh, do that on the calculator you find you get 4.059 times 10 to the minus 19 joules so that's the energy transferred from the photon to each electron okay right <clears throat> Right, describe how a calibration graph is produced and used to find the concentration of the ion two complex. Well, first of all, making the calibration graph, you get a series of solutions, a series of Fe3 plus solutions, yeah, of known concentration. And then you measure the absorbance of each of those, of each solution using the colorimeter. Okay. Plot, then you plot a graph, a calibration curve, and then you measure the absorbance of your unknown. And then uh, using interpolation, interpolate the value of absorbance to find concentration on your graph. Okay, that would more than enough there to get the marks. Okay. Right, just I've, I've just done the method again there, so we remind ourselves. So the concentration of IN3 in the solution is 4.66 times 10 to the minus three. Calculate the mass of iron in the tablet used to make the 250 centimeters cubed of solution. So if you remember, we've got the, it says in the method there, you get the whole tablet there and you make it up to 250 centimeters cubed. And then you take a little bit of that out of this solution and measure the concentration using your calibration curve. Right, so we wanna work out the total, we want to do the mass, and so let's work out the total moles of iron. So let's do the moles of Fe3 plus in total is gonna be equal to the concentration times by the volume. The concentration is 4.66 times 10 to the minus three. The volume they tell us is 250, so that's 0.25 dm cubed. So that is equal to 1.165 times 10 to the minus three um, moles of Fe3 plus. So therefore we must have the same moles of Fe3 
of FFE. The tablet is the same. Now we need to work out the mass of the iron. How do we work out the mass of the iron? So the mass of the iron is equal to the moles multiplied by the AR of iron. So that's 1.165 times 10 to the minus three. Multiple the AR of iron is 55.8. So that is equal to 0.0. 650 grams. Um, <clears throat> it asks us for in milligrams though, doesn't it? So multiply by a thousand, that gives us 65.0 milligrams. Okay, question about cisplatin. Okay, uses an anti cancer drug, works by causing the death of rapidly dividing cells. Okay, how does it do that? It does that by binding to the DNA, doesn't it? And it stops uh, replication, DNA replication. So it binds to the DNA, um, uh, disrupts, so you can't base pair, if you do biology, you can't base pair, you don't need to say all that. And then, so you can't get base pairing, so you can't make the complementary strand uh, and you get no DNA replication. Okay, after cisplatin enters the cell, one of the chloride ligands is replaced by water to form a complex B. Give an equation for this reaction. Well, you need, well we've got P, well, they give us a formula of cisplatin there, sorry. So it's PT, NH3. We've got two ammonia ligands and we've got two chloride ligands. So they are Cl minus. So that means that the platinum must be a plus two ion. So just put like plus, I numerals there to remind ourselves. The overall thing is, an, is cisplatin is in charge. One of those chlorides are going to be replaced by water. So I'm going to put plus H2O. Same color. Plus H2O. And that is going to form um, PT NH3. You've still got two of those. We've only got one chloride. We've got one H2O. Uh, now, uh, the, the, the uh, you've only got you've got a, a plus two on the platinum, you've got a one minus on the chloride. So the overall charge of this of, the, of this is now plus one, and the chloride ligand comes off. We've got Cl minus. There's our equation. Now, uh, this next question, uh, quite. You have to remember, it was quite a, it was quite tricky, really, because you've got to remember which um, how cisplatin reacts with the guanine residue. Okay, so it tells us uh, complex B reacts with DNA, uh, and the water molecule is replaced. It forms a bond between the platinum and and a nitrogen atom in the guanine molecule. Now, the nitrogen you have to know it is that particular nitrogen there. That's the one which um, the guanine will form, uh, that's, that's the one that the uh, cisplatin, uh, the, the nitrogens of that will form a dated bond to the um, platinum. So I'm gonna draw the lone pairs on there. Okay, and each of those is gonna form a dative to the PT atom and the cisplatin there. Uh, and they replace the chloride in the water ligand. So we've still got our two uh, NH3 Ligands up here. So that, that is how the platinum reacts with the guanine residues. Okay. So uh, you like, if you didn't know that, you can know it, or you do know it. If you didn't know the, uh, which, which you have the, the nitrogens, the platinum um, bonded to, then you'd be, you'd be in trouble. Okay. Right. Uh, an experiment is done to investigate the rate of reaction. During the experiment, the concentration of cisplatin is measured at one minute intervals. Right. OK, so I'm just going to sketch the graph. I don't know you need to put it in your, in your answer, but you're going to draw a graph. OK. Explain how graphical methods can be used to process the measured results to confirm it's a first order reaction. Right. So what you should put there 
is you want the concentration of cisplatin there. I'll just call it that. And this is going to be time here. And you're going to end up with a, a graph which looks something like that. Fit quick rate reaction at first. Then as the concentration of the cisplatin falls, it's the rate slows down. Okay. So how do you find out the, the rate from that graph? Well, rate is actually equal to the well, it's the gradient, strictly speaking, it's the minus gradient, isn't it, of the curve. So what you need to do is you need to find the gradient at, say, a certain concentration of cisplatin there. How do you do that? You draw a tangent. So draw a tangent, find the gradient, um, and, and hence the, the rate. Then I would, uh, so that's a, this is at say concentration one of cisplatin. Then what next you do is you draw a tangent at concentration two, which is so that's say it's half of that value. So we do it there. So find the gradient of that tangent. Find the gradient, hence the rate. So you've got the rate for two different concentrations. And then you need to look, say, does rate double when conk doubles? Uh, well, that is, then it's first order, it's a first order reaction. Okay, that, that's how, they, how AQA want you to do it. Uh, if uh, AQA don't actually mention this, what well, other A-level boards do, but uh, and if you look in the marks team, they let you do it this way. Uh, uh, you you might know that the half life uh, for it for cisplatin, okay, or re reagent. So that's the time taken for conch to fall to half its value. Well, that's constant for a first order reaction. And it's not constant for a second order reaction or, or anything else. So that would probably be the, 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 the easiest way of doing it. But um, so look for the, use the graph to, to time how long it takes for the rea uh, concentration of the cisplatin to form by a half. Um, and it, it should be constant if the reaction is first order. Well, as I say, that's not strictly speaking on the AQA syllabus. Uh, if you want to do it that way instead, the first way I said, that's fine. You get all the marks. Okay, so here, now this looks like it's going to be about the Arrhenius equation because they're asking us to plot this one over the absolute temperature and um, the natural log of the rate constant. So, so the first bit, all you simply got to do is, so the change in the temperature and measuring the effect that has on the rate constant. So we just got to, uh, if I just scroll down a little bit, you can see they are asking about the Arrhenius equation here. Look, they give us the Arrhenius equation. So we're going to make that fit into the, uh, there's the equation for a straight line. And we're going to use these results. We're going to plot um, on the y-axis, we're going to plot natural log of k. On the x-axis, we're going to plot the natural log of 1 over t. There. So that you can probably see the gradient there is going to be this. That's the gradient m is equal to minus ea over rt. And we're going to use this to work out the activation. So just minus EA over R, yeah. Okay, so um, we just need to fill in that. So you need to do one over 318, which gives you 0.00314. And you need to take the natural log of that. So you press the LN button on your calculator and put the number in. And if you do that, you get minus 14.2. Right, then it asks us to use this to plot, use this table to plot on this axis here, which I've done here. 
Okay. And so that we've got there. Now we said before the gradient of this line M is equal to the minus the activation energy over R, the gas constant. Okay. And it wants us to work out the activation energy here. So first of all, we're gonna to have to work out the, the gradient. So there's our change in Y. So delta Y, the change in Y of this line is, so we've got uh, minus 18, uh, minus, minus um, 13.6, that gives us minus 4.4. .4. And here, the change in the x-axis. So that is going to be um, minus, that's going to be equal to 0 0.00343 minus 0 0.0031, which is equal to 3.3 times 10 to the minus 4. So our gradient m is equal to minus 4.4 over this. That gives us minus 13,333. Okay, now we're gonna use this equation to work out EA. I right, have to be a bit careful with the units here. Okay, so if we rearrange that, we get that um, EA is equal to minus uh, M multiplied by R. Now, if we just look at our units here, R is measured in joules per mole per Kelvin. So that means our answer EA is going to be in joules per mole, not in kilojoules per mole. Okay, so we do that EA is equal to minus three, three, minus, minus, yeah, because it makes the Activation energy positive, minus, minus 13,333, multiplied by um, R, 8.31. That gives us 110,797 joules per mole. Now to three significant figures and convert into, into kilojoules divided by 1,000. That is equal to 1,001, sorry, 111 kilojoules per mole that is our activation energy okay now question five a bomb calorimeter can be used for accurate determination of heat change so a bomb calorimeter contains a fixed volume and that, that's very important for later on and it withstands changes in pressure during the reaction they mix the fuel with the oxygen and the temperature change uh, is ignited, it burns, and the temperature change is recorded. The total heat capacity of the calorimeter is calculated using a fuel that you know the heat change for. So you kind of know delta H, yeah, the heat change, they're calling it there. They're not calling it delta H, we'll see later why they're not, but that's what they mean, the heat change. Um, okay, um, and so you use that to find out the heat capacity of the, of the, um, of the uh, calorimeter. Okay, and then you're going to put that into um, uh, this equation. Okay, so we're going to work out C, the heat of the calorimeter. We know what Q is, first of all, and then we're going to work backwards to find the unknown. Okay, so let's do the first bit calculate the heat capacity C cal in kilojoules per Kelvin. Right, so what we've got here. So this is the this is the bit we're talking about the green and the green here. So they burned two grams of hexane. So how many moles of hexane have they burnt there? Let's do that first of all. Moles is equal to two over the mR of hexane, which they tell us is eighty six. Two over eighty six. That is equal to. Point zero two three three moles. Okay, so now they tell us that the um, 
one mole of hexane releases 4154. Okay, so let's say the heat released then. So the heat released, we'll call it HR, is equal to 4154 multiplied by the number of moles that we actually burn. Okay, so how much heat have we released here? Well, it's 4154 multiplied by 0 0.0233 moles of hexane. That gives us um, 96.6 kilojoules. Okay, so that's the heat released. Now we're going to have to use this equation here. We're going to have to rearrange that. We need to find out C-Cal. So C-Cal rearrange is going to be Q divided by delta T. Well, Q, the heat released in the reaction, is going to be um, this. Divided by the temperature change. I'm going to call that Q instead. Yeah. Uh, the temperature change, which is um, 12.4. So that gives us 7.79 uh, kilojoules per Kelvin. So we're going to use that later on in the next bit of the question. I think that is our answer to that bit there, 7.79. Now, in the next bit, we need to work out the heat released for a different fuel for octane. Okay, so here we go. Experiment is repeat two grams of octane. So we're gonna use the same equations before. So we, we're gonna have Q, the heat released, is gonna be equal to um, C cal. So what do they call it? C cal multiplied by Delta T. Okay. And also the heat change in kilojoules per mole for octane is going to be equal to Q, the heat released in the experiment, uh, divided by the moles of octane that we're actually burning. So we're going to use this. Um, okay, we're going to use this one first of all. Let's well, let's work out the moles of octane first. Okay, uh, actually, let's just work out Q first of all. Yeah. So Q, the heat released, is this C cal? We worked that out to be in the last part about seven point seven nine kilojoules per kelvin. The temperature rise was twelve point two. So the heat release Q is, in this case, is equal to uh, 95 point naught kilojoules, okay? Now, we can put that value of Q into there, but we need to work out the moles of octane, first of all. So our moles octane is equal to the mass divided by the MR of octane. What's the mass of octane? We've got two grams of it. <clears throat> and divide by the MR, which is 114. Okay, that is equal to 0 0.01754. Okay, now we've got to put that number into this equation to work out our heat change in kilojoules per mole. This heat change thing is really delta H, but it's not quite delta H. We'll see why in a minute. Heat change in kilojoules per mole is equal to Q, which is 95.0, divided by the number of moles, which is 0 0.01754. And that gives us 5,415 kilojoules per mole which is approximately equal to delta H, okay, this heat change, but it's not quite. And the next bit of the question, they say delta HC for combustion, that should be, and of course, you'd, you'd put a minus in there if you're doing that because it's exothermic. 
Right, the next bit of the question, it says, state why the heat change calculated from the bomb calorimeter is not an enthalpy change. Well, because it's not measured at constant pressure. Right, the definition of enthalpy change is the energy change at constant pressure. We've actually done this at constant volume, which is slightly different to an enthalpy, or be a slightly different number. So that's what that means there. Okay, uh, the thermometer used to identify the, the, um, the temperature change of 12.2 had an uncertainty of 0 0.01 in each reading, right? So that means we're gonna to have to use it twice to get a temperature change. You need to have the initial temperature and the final temperature. There's two readings there. So that means you've got the total uncertainty is two times 0.1, because take two readings, i.e. 0.2. So our percentage uncertainty is gonna be equal to the uncertainty divided by the actual temperature we measured with it, which is 12.2, multiplied by 100. And do that, it works out to be 1.64%. Question six. Right, standard hydrogen electrode potentials are measured by comparison with the standard hydrogen electrode. State the substances and conditions needed in a standard hydrogen electrode. Well, you need hydrogen gas at one atmosphere pressure, which is 100 kilopascals. You must measure, must measure it 298 Kelvin, standard temperature. Um, the concentration of the hydrogen ions must be equal to one mole per decimeter cubed. So you have HCl usually of concentration, um, one mole per decimeter cubed. And you'd also need some platinum uh, to make the connection. Okay, that's the, what you need for the standard hydrogen electrode. Right, it's difficult to ensure consistency with a set of hydrogen electrodes because you need hydrogen gas and pressure and all that sort of stuff. So you can use this copper as a secondary standard. Okay, so you compare it against the copper electrode instead of the standard hydrogen electrode. And a student does an experiment to measure the standard electrode potential for this system. Okay, right, so we've got TiO2 going to titanium, uh, a suitable solution containing the acidified uh, TiO2 plus iron is formed when you dissolve this stuff in water to make 50 centimeters cubed of solution. Right, describe an experiment the student does to show the standard electrode potential uh, is point, minus 0.88 volts. Okay, so how would you do that? You provided with the copper electrode, a solution of the um, uh, TiOSO4, solid that you've got to make the solution up you've got sulfuric acid and you've got titanium okay and so on right what would you do well first of all we've got to make up the titanium electrode so i'm going to just draw that there so uh, we would need to have a concentration of the tio2 plus ions of one mole per decimeter cubed there and we're going to have a piece of titanium in metal in there the strip of titanium but we need to um we need to say how to make up the solution okay right so let's do making up the solution first of all okay so details should be should be given of how to prefer the solution of acidified tio2 okay well we needed to make it that concentration so and we need how much we want uh, 50 centimeters cubed of solution and the concentration is got to be one mole per decimeter cubed. So how many moles of um, the of the uh, titanium? So moles of TiO2 plus 
and that's going to be equal to the moles of of the sulfate of that, which we're going to dissolve. Okay, that's going to be equal to concentration times volume. Our concentration is one, and the volume is 50 centimeters cubed. That's 0 0.05 dm cubed. So that's going to be equal to 0 0.05 moles. Uh, next, we need to work out the, um, the mass of that. So the mass of TiSO4. that we need to weigh out is going to be moles times by the MR. That's 0 0.05 multiplied by another MR of this stuff they tell us in the question is, is 159.9. Do that, we get a mass of, 7.995 grams, right, if you've only got a, uh, so let's say, if you've only got a balance which is accurate to a hundredth of a gram, you're going to be measuring out 8.00 grams of TiOSO4, and you're going to dissolve that in total volume, the total volume that is dissolved in, in, the, um, in the sulfuric acid, of 50 centimeters cubed. Okay, and then let's just show the what the, what the actual cell we're gonna set up at. Now, um, it says, we've got to show that the standard electrode potential of the titanium one that we're interested in, well, that is equal to minus 0.88 volts. Whereas they tell us the copper, standard electrode potential of the copper one, that is more positive. That's equal to plus 0.34 volts. So uh, the, the standard way of doing things is to put the positive one on the right hand side. So I'm going to have, we're going to set up here a beaker of, um, this is our copper electrode. This is going to be a copper strip. The solution is going to be copper sulfate solution. Uh, a one mole per decimeter cubed, that's going to give us um, a copper ion concentration of the same thing. That's what it should be for standard. We're going to have our titanium electrode on the other side, which we talked about before, how to make up the solution and so on. There's our piece of titanium metal. This is our TiO2 solution. We need to connect these with a salt bridge. So that's a filter paper soaked in concentrated uh, or saturated potassium nitrate. That will do fine, or most any ionic compound, really. Um, and then we're going to connect them with wires and a voltmeter. Okay, this is going to be a high resistance voltmeter to stop current flowing. Otherwise, you won't get the, the if you let current flow, you won't get an accurate value. Um, and let's just see how we would calculate that. Well, we know the E cell is equal to E right minus E left. And we'd probably expect the value of E cell there, right? So we'd expect the E right is uh, the copper one, that's plus 0.34 volts. The E left is the titanium one. We're trying to show that it's minus 0.88 volts. So um, if you do that, you get, um, uh, you should get uh, the, the cell has a voltage of 1.22 volts. I think that's all, the, okay. And you should make sure the temperature is 298 Kelvin standard conditions. Uh, I think that covers about everything. Right, uh, gives the half equation for the reaction in the TiO2 electrode. Okay, so we're gonna have the oxidized thing is gonna be the dioxo titanium ion, and it's gonna get reduced to the titanium metal. Right, uh, in acidic conditions, right? So we balance for oxygens, we want a, an H2O there. That means balance for hydrogens, we want two H pluses there. Balance for charges, we've got four plus on the left and zero on the right, so we need four electrons there. There's our half equation. 
table two shows some electro potential data. Okay. Um, right. Use the data in the table to explain why copper does not react with most acids, but it will react with nitric acid. And then give an equation with reaction with copper and nitric acid. Right. Why won't copper won't react with most acids? Well, copper metal, if we look at these two half equations here, copper metal uh, will not react with H+. Plus. And the reason for that is this is this one here is the most positive um, uh, <clears throat> of, the, of the half cells. So that one you'd expect to go forward. So in other words, you'd expect copper 2 plus to actually turn into copper metal, not the other way around. And this is most negative. So you'd expect that to go, give out electrons and go backwards. Um, uh, and so that would, hydrogen gas would actually form H plus, not the other way around. Okay, so you need to just say for that, that the, the um, E cell of the copper system is more positive than, sorry, E cell, the electrode potential of the standard hydrogen electrode. So we need to say there, but it will react with nitric acid because it's not actually reacting with the H plus as an oxidizing agent. It's going to react with the nitrate ion. Okay. So we're going to look at these two here. Now, if you look at those two, the most positive one there is now the, this one here. So that's going to take in, take in electrons. The nitrate ion is going to take in electrons. And this one is the most negative. So the copper atom is going to give out electrons to form the copper ion. So um, let's see. So that blue one is going to go forwards. And that red one there is going to go backwards. Right. We need to write the uh, equation. Now we need to be careful there because we've got that's two electrons and that's three. So we need to multiply this one by three and multiply that one by two. OK. So the equation there would be we are going to have two, two nitrate ions and two, we're going to have eight H plus ions and we're going to have three copper atoms. And the products it's going to give us are, well, it's going to give us <coughs> two and out. It's going to give us four waters and it's going to give us three copper uh, two plus ions. So uh, that is the equation there. You can probably, if you want to, um, if you combine, uh, no, I'd leave it as that. That's fine. Leave it like that. Yeah. Okay. Now that is um, about halfway. So I will continue with uh, the rest of the paper in the next video and that's largely just the multiple choice sections so i'll stop there now